Welcome to Framework Leadership, a podcast about principles and ideas that you can use in your context today, uh, and, and, and principles that you can take your leadership to really a breakthrough, next level uh, approach. Exclusively now, it's going to be on our SCU podcast network. I'm your host, Kent Engel, president of Southeastern University, and uh, I'm excited to introduce our co-host for today's show. SCU Executive Vice President, Dr. Chris Owen. Welcome uh, to this edition. Uh, you know, I, I'm excited because we're launching this brand new SEU podcast network. It's going to be an opportunity to feature uh, a lot of people in our community. We have, of course, being a um, an educational institution, we have experts in a variety of fields. And to be able to sit down and have conversation with uh, faculty uh, specifically to gain insight uh, as we, uh, you know, hit the challenges, hit the times that we're facing right now. And, and of course, it rapidly changes. Uh, I mean, it can change in a day. Yeah. And you have to be ready to uh, understand the dynamics. And, and so we're excited to be able to celebrate the voices that we have in our own community, but also celebrate a lot of voices outside the community. Yeah, what a great opportunity. Every time we sit down and hear uh, we've been here for over a decade now, and we're hearing things from professors and staff members and things we never knew were, were taking place. So I'm excited about the discovery process over the next year as this rolls out. There's some very unique and very capable leaders that have emerged and been on this campus for quite some time. Yeah, and we want to celebrate them. Today we're going to talk about um, a poisonous culture. Uh, here's the reality. There are companies and organizations that suffer from poisonous cultures, and, and most of the time, they don't even realize realize it, uh, whether it's originating from uh, an executive leadership team or middle management. The culture of an unhealthy organization can ultimately lead it to uh, be in a state of decline, uh, or it begin to lead it to demise. Uh, and before it's too late, uh, the damage can be irreversible. Uh, culture needs to be constantly addressed, constantly restored, uh, constantly updated in a way that again builds a, a, a unified community in, in mission, because it's all about mission, who you are, what you need to accomplish. And this is a task only I think uh, top leaders have, uh, for sure have to have the mindset that uh, they're the ones that create design and make sure that uh, it is always empowered. Uh, as we jump into the podcast, I want to start by laying what I think is the entire foundation um, of, of this, and, and, and that is we've got to understand what is culture and why is, why is it important? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, you and I have been together for a decade now, and this is my favorite conversation. There's nothing more powerful than culture, right? So you've heard the phrase culture trumps vision every time, the, the priority of culture. You, you start to ask in an academic setting, why do some teams that seem to be stacked, they have all the talent, they have everything, get outperformed by teams that don't look like they have the same amount of resources? And we all look and go, that's culture. Right? So Harvard did a 10-year uh, a study on over 200 companies, and they identified that those companies that have strong organizational culture, their net revenue was 700 plus times uh, greater than the, than the other organizations that didn't, didn't have a strong culture. So we know that culture is kind of the secret sauce, but still a lot of leaders they think it's mystical and it's about, well, you've got to find the right people and it, it's this and that. But culture is simply just uh, a group of people, relationships rallied around a single cause, right? So this idea of what is culture, it comes from the Latin word cultus, which is care, right? So there's this whole kind of emerging thing of cultivating and, and that's been one of our words of the year here. Uh, but the idea of culture is uh, you could say that it's, it's, it's shared values and it's shared norms, and, and that, that, that's, that's it. But I, I break it down to this. It's the space between us, Kent. It's what you and I put in the space between us. Culture is how we agree to do life together. What are those things that we celebrate together? What are those things that we go, no, we won't tolerate that? And I go back to uh, my bend towards culture was my first cup of coffee with you. And we were sitting at Mitchell's Coffee Shop, downtown Lakeland. I had been here for a couple years, hadn't had a great experience. Be honest with you, you were kind of the rescuer that came in, the board brought you in, you were just new as president, and you and I were having this conversation that was like, 
I think I can work with you, and, and I think I can work with you. And I asked you this question, and they were culture questions. I said, what, what's the behavior that when you see it in one of your lead team, you, it puts a smile on your face? You didn't blink. Most great leaders never have to wonder what is it that they celebrate? What is their culture? And I remember what you said to me. You said, oh, I celebrate lifelong learners who make decisions in real time, and they don't back up when times get tough. Then I ask you the other side of that culture question. I said, what are the things that when you see it, it ticks you off? And you said, arrogance. There's no room for it. I, 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 don't, I don't tolerate that. We serve other people. So culture, the power of what culture is, is networks of relationships that are rallied around a common goal. And I think that is the power. And uh, Dan, Daniel Cole, I'm reading a book right now because I never stopped learning and growing about this called The Culture Code. And I'll talk about it a little bit more today. But I think that, to me, is the essence is that space between us. It's this network of relationships. But I'm curious for you, because we just referred to the strong culture on our campus. Uh, how would you define? What, what is it that you, you say, hey, this is what I think culture is? Yeah, well, I, I, I fully believe, first off, that culture is going to be unique based on, as you already mentioned, the people that are there. Yeah. The people that... Um, are already part of what makes that community flourish, what makes that community strong. And I believe that culture encompasses the attitudes. It encompasses the, the behaviors of that unique group, that, that, that it makes it special. Uh, for every organization, there is that specific culture. There's no doubt about that. And that culture will direct every movement of that organization, whether that's in a positive movement or whether that's in a, in a, in a negative movement. And, and I think also I've always um, looked at the approach to how to uh, create a, a, a culture that encompasses, you know, the ability to come alongside, to encourage, to empower, to uh, celebrate. It, it is always that mindset of others oriented, yeah. where you're constantly thinking of the other person. Mm. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? What are they going through? What are the circumstances? And because in the midst of a, you know, especially what we've been facing in the last um, there are so many attitudes and emotions and feelings, and it takes it takes uh, an intentional mindset to say, you know what, I'm going to do everything I can to listen, to learn, and to understand what they're going through, what's happening, so that I know how to come alongside and empower. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it will direct every movement of the organization when you begin to understand that. I love the way that you say that... Um, culture uh, motivating, uh, you say that culture motivating a group of people to move, it's all about moving a group of people to go into the same direction for a cause that's greater than themselves. You always, uh, in, when, you, when you talk about culture uh, in, in more of a, um, a formal setting, you always share a clip from the movie Finding Nemo when you talk about culture. Tell me what uh, was happening in that scene and the leadership principle that you always take away from that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm sitting in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. There's an executive coach that, that, that was, uh, was doing some coaching with us at the time, and he shared this Nemo principle. And I told him then and there in that moment, so I'm going to steal this and I'm going to use it until people go, Nemo, what is that? <laughs> so it's the end of the movie. If you haven't seen it, I don't know how you can call yourself a leader. This is the greatest leadership principle movie. Yes, it's a cartoon, but it's an animation, but it's incredible. The end of the movie, Nemo's been reunited with his father. Uh, Dory, his little traveling partner, is everybody's there together. And you see this big troller coming in the background as they're celebrating. And you think all the crisis is resolved. And this big net scoops up all of the fish, including Dory. And now we have one last crisis in this, this, this animation, this, this narrative. And you see the dad grabbing, trying to grab a hold of, of Nemo. I just found you. You don't go. He goes, no, dad, I can do this. And this, this, there's this moment where he gets all of the fish inside of this net. They're, the net's pulling them to the surface. And he goes, just swim down. Just swim down. And all of a sudden, fish start going, just swim down. Just keep, just, just swim down. And all of a sudden, the entire pod of fish start to overpower the net and it breaks and, and you, you've got everyone reunited and Nemo is the hero of the day. But out of that moment, 
That to me is one of the greatest leadership principles. My ability, our ability to motivate a group of people to move in the same direction for a cause greater than themselves. It's one thing to save your own neck, but it's another to say, I am entwined with a group of people and we together will overcome. And I think that is a powerful reflection of of the result of culture. Like you get people moving and you can't do it without language. Right. You gotta have that common language of how people talk about who you are. And I think that was one of the things that I, I enjoyed about you from the very beginning and continue is the clarity by which you can talk about, here's how I see the future. If we're operating and we're hitting on all cylinders, this is who God's called us to be, and it looks like this, it sounds like this, and it feels like this. And I think great leaders have that ability to paint a picture that motivates people to move. Yeah, and and as with any organization, leaders have to really have to focus on um, uh, listening yeah. and contextual discovery, which is really a part of our, our framing process. We operate on framework leadership, and actually culture is in our urgent framework. Yeah. And we designed an urgent framework which says, you know, these five things we must consistently accomplish. Um, and culture is um, uh, one of those significant uh, pieces of, of urgent framing that we have to um, we have to make sure that we're constantly evaluating, solidifying, um, and and it it as an organization grows, you have to become even more intentional. Yeah. Um, and and that's why there has to be some mechanism that keeps you grounded to listening and discovering. Um, you know I. I'll be the first to admit we, you know, we have had rapid uh, growth at this university. Going from when we started together, enrollment was about 2,400 students, a little above that. Yeah. Now to uh, to right at 10,000. Uh, you know, definitely the organization is going to change. What's going to change is uh, time management. Yeah. What's going to change is scheduling. What's going to change? Uh, I mean, it's just it's been a, a massive, uh, you know, rapid um, uh, increase, and so. Oftentimes, you can get out of sync in in that listening and discovering. And and I'll be honest, you know, because of my schedule and because I've had to, you know, really think about how do I get back to that reengaging so that I can understand the dynamics of this growing organization. And for me, it begins uh, with conversations. You know, just sitting down, as you said, we sat down that first time over a cup of coffee. I love to do that. That's my, you know, um, the way I the way I listen is doing that, having these kind of informal, relational. Um, so it, it, for me, beginning, you know, conversations and let others share their thoughts and 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 ask yourself how do how you know, in as you engage with them, how did we, how are we handling culture? Yeah. How are we handling? the conflicts? How are we handling the, the significant issues? Uh, you know, by asking these kinds of questions, I think you will tangibly begin to see the different, um, different things, negativity, lack of empathy, bad ethos. Uh, uh, you will tangibly see, you know, la- low morale, lack of communication. Um, you know, you might begin to see high, high emplo- uh, employee turnover, yeah. uh, the separation between boss uh, and employee, mis- micromanaging, preferential yeah. treatment. Uh, Chris, what, what in your, um, what are some in your uh, understanding and awareness as you deal with, you know, especially growth in an organization? What are some of the characteristics that you do see of an unhealthy culture that you've experienced? Yeah. So one of the things just responding to what you're saying, most leaders don't do what you're doing right now. Let's just let's just call that the way it is. And some people might say, well, he's your boss. You're just sucking up to him on his podcast. No, I'm not. Uh, most leaders don't take the time or they're afraid to sit face to face across from another human being and go, hey, how have we done navigating this issue? I was just with you in a meeting where you called it and you said, hey, I want to hear from this individual. And the very first thing you said was, the pandemic has caused us, we've made some decisions and it's affected human lives. How has that unfolded? What's your perception of this? So one of the things when you talk about culture, 
um, uh, both in, and if you're a leader and you're listening to this, this is a great conversation. Some supplementals for this is Dan, Dan, Daniel Coyle's book, The Culture Code, and then Rowan Williams, The Way of St. Benedict. Both of these guys in talking about uh, culture, whether it's a monastic order or the Cleveland Indians and, and whatnot, they talk about this level of vulnerability. You can't have culture, a positive culture, without relationship. Right? So if you look at the definition, a group of relationships, if you're unwilling as a leader to expose, uh, to have, enter into real dialogue, human to human interaction, then you've already set the tone and the lid on your culture. You're not going to have a healthy culture. Why? Because you're in an ivory tower or in a bunker somewhere and what you say goes. And I'm watching this in churches and organizations that leaders, when you treat people like products, rather than unique expressions of God that don't exist anywhere else on the planet, right? You, it, it, as humans, and the nature of business is the larger it grows, sometimes that happens, Kent, it, not on purpose. Right. Just the, the momentum of the right. sheer organization. And that's what I'm hearing you say is, hey, I had to take a step back and go, no, I'm, I'm, my pace has pushed me out of listening. Listening is the core of, of relationship and culture. So to answer that question, Simply, I would say this, three things that I would say uh, identify a poisonous culture for me. One is just three letters, ego. When you have a leader who it's my way or the highway, I'm not listening to anyone, I don't have a relationship, you, you, might, you might have a great bottom line. We see leaders all over the place. But most of the time, those leaders create a toxic organization who either produce for a short time or they fail to produce at all. And so this idea that uh, everything in the organization revolves around the senior leader and his or her ego and need to, to get credit for everything, um, that, that's an that's a indicator of a poisonous culture. Um, in team culture, I would say the single greatest factor, I call it cancer uh, to any great team, is unresolved conflict, mm. right? Unresolved Absolutely. conflict. And, and you have to deal ruthlessly with unresolved conflict, why? Because that pits teammate against teammate. Rather than uh, joining together for a, a single cause, now my cause in every meeting is to not be outperformed by you, or to not be outdone by you, or I need to get the credit rather than you. That's a toxic uh, culture. And then the third thing is, I, I would just say, a uh, sheer lack in a poisonous culture. You can look at the language, and it's very warlike. It's very uh, dominant, and, and you'll see that fear, uh, in my opinion, is, is one of the great, greatest toxic elements uh, of an organization, when fear exists. And so, like you said, culture is fragile, right? It's yeah. not a problem to be solved. Right. It's a tension to manage. manage. And you have to continue to come back around as a leader. And the more you come back around, it's part science and it's part art. So you know you've got to have language, you know you've got to have stories, you know you've got to have experiences that people say, wow, this is real. This SEU thing is real. Um, but then you've got to come back around in the context and go, what's happening now? And evaluation. So both of these authors talk about safety in culture, right? Safety. Am I safe here? And I think sometimes the larger the organization grows, your pace picks up and you're making decisions that you think are in the best interest and you have failed to reconnect with people way on the other side of the organization and their, their perception of your decisions are way different. Yeah. They might look and say, that, that's hostile. Yeah, let me, let me um, follow up on, on two of those characteristics that you mentioned and, and, and let's, let's get some practical application yeah. And how how does that happen? So you talked about fear, and you talked about conflict. Um, you know, in our team over the last ten years, we've had, as you know, we've had a few conflicts. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, a, lo a talk, lot involving talk me. Talk about talk about <laughs> how uh, how how did we approach that, and how did we resolve that? Because it, uh, we, we want to get real practical here. Well, let, let's say uh, I think the first leadership retreat we ever we ever took, I got into it with someone who's no longer in the organization. But uh, let, to say that it was a, a, a vibrant conversation <laughs> filled with uh, passion and color uh, is an understatement. And I remember you calling the two of us. We had a pretty, it was a disagreement around character. 
And uh, you called the two of us to the side after the meeting and said, look, I'm all for conflict resolution. But if you ever act like that again in one of my meetings, <laughs> I'm going to throw you out. So that was the beginning uh, of that storming phase of our team. But, but through the years, there's been consistent behavior. And so we've had some other performance issues. And I remember one time you had three of us in a room. And, and unresolved conflict, when it gets in front of you, it's humorous now because I've been with you for so long. It, it's like a bad smell. Yeah. You, you're not going to tolerate it. Get it out of here. What's going on? So it's pretty quickly that you get us all in the same room. Yeah. You identify the problems best you understand. And you go, okay, boys, girls, what do you have to say about this? This is what I see. This is what I've heard. Let's talk about this right now. And when you shine a light on unresolved conflict, um, more often than not, you, you determine a few things. Is there someone in that room that's toxic? And, and how do you know they're toxic? They're unwilling to admit they've done anything wrong, right? That, that's not a phrase that ever lasts very long on our team. Uh, well, I, I've done nothing wrong. You know, everyone's got responsibility right. in some way. And if you're not seeking peace in a healthy way, then there's some, some, some toxicity. So you, you, would, you would lay that out, and uh, those conversations uh, are always awkward. Sure. Uh, but healthy. They're going to be difficult. Yeah, yeah they're, they're going to be difficult. But, but it, it's so true. You've got to get everybody in the room. And you got to listen yeah. and 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 get perspective so that you can then okay well here's how we can and and quite frankly half the time when everybody is in the room and you start sharing the other individual might say I had no idea yeah you know or yeah. you just don't yeah you know it's which leads to this whole um, fear you talked about fear fear is really that um, you're you're kind of assuming yeah rather than actually knowing. So communication is is so important that that we are constantly communicating with each other in a way that can remove that. And and we've had some of those no. you know uh where there was fear and we had no idea um with some of our, you know, team members. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's it's when it's human nature, and then even in like the MBTI personality profile. I remember when I went through that here, uh, it pointed something out to me that I, I had no clue, but it made so much sense in my life. My personality is such that when I'm removed from the leader, uh, I I tend to think the worst, and yeah. there's negativity right, fills that right. gap, and so that's why relationship and communication are so key. So we talked about negative aspects. Yeah. What what about um, a healthy culture? What what are some of those key attributes you, s you recognize? You can see, yeah, we're on the right track. We're 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 creating a unified, together, healthy uh, environment. Yeah, I think for years I've used this this little framework or this 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 uh, rubric of language, story, experience, and celebration. So all to me, great great uh, culture. Vibrant culture is something that is felt before it's, it's heard. I've experienced it in this way of, wow, this place is, is different. What, what's, what's going on? We hear that with, with people saying, well, your students, they all greet me with a smile on their face and they look me in their eye. And, and uh, all the conversations that I have between your president and even people, directors or, or just faculty members, you use the same language in talking about why you're here. So for me, uh, great culture begins obviously with relationship, but every relationship has a common language. How do we talk about what we do? Divine design. You know, God, God uniquely created you to be a solution to a problem. We're, we're sitting in a brand new building that's on a wall downstairs, not because we think it's slick, but because it's who, we, who are. we are. Yeah. Right. And you're going to experience that. So language to me is the essence of a great organization of how do we talk about us and what does our uh, if we did everything that we thought is right to do for us, that God's laid in our heart to do, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? And the more clearly you can articulate, great cultures have clear language. Yeah, and and, and it goes it goes to to relationship, and and relationship fosters that clear language. You you spend time with people. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I remember when I first came, one of the things that would, was very important to me is to, again, coming out of, of understanding and knowing where the university had been. And of course they were two years without a, a president before I came. Uh, uh, and 
I wanted to to start to really get to know faculty. So Karen and I made it, um, you know, a priority. We would host, and we did. We hosted every faculty person in our home to just spend time with and begin to discover, to learn va- their values, their expectations, their. Um, and you actually don't necessarily have to do that in a formal way, yeah. but but just sitting around a meal, you know, yeah. you 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 discern that and pick that up, and you know when when you when you show people that you care, you you will empower them. And by the way, when you are in a relational setting and you are face to face, people will it's it, it, they're going to discern mm-hmm. is that real? Yeah, is that you know it, you know it, because you'll see heart. You'll see, you'll see uh, soul, um, and and that'll come forth in a way that begins to empower. It's the idea of no one, you know, cares what you know until they know that you care, yeah. and that only comes when you sit down mm-hmm. and you're face to face. And and that leads me. So how do you? Because what it what it's fostering is um, building trust. Honestly, yeah. yeah. Uh, so what are some things with your teams that you've done to build that trust factor? Yeah, so let's, let's talk about a yeah, great question. The, the, the teams that I lead directly, here is something that has worked out for me, and, and now I've got almost 20 years of saying I can look back and go, this works. Uh, I know what it feels like to have a leader use me, use me for my talents, my abilities, so that they could look good on a platform somewhere and then never really care about me as a person. Um, so I, I just said, Hey, when I'm there and I'm leading other people, I'm going to care about them first and make sure they know they're not a commodity to me that I want them to grow and I want them to win. And if that winning means they move to another organization because they've succeeded and and they're going to run their own, I don't own them. And so having an open hand mentality with my teams where I'm, I want to be known as the guy who calls out, I say the God in them right? The good in them. Like, hey, when you do this, that's your unfair advantage. Nobody else does that the way that you do. And when you become a voice of encouragement, uh, I I just said, man, I want to speak more positive than I do negative ever. And when I do have to point out a negative, I want it to be in a positive way. Like, hey, you're hurting yourself there. Let's move in this direction. And what I have found is, is when uh, I think you're, the way you talk about it is empowering leadership, right? So when I'm empowering people through encouragement and through coaching, I think sitting here at 48 years old, here's what I realized. I get paid, I get paid to, to solve problems and coach leaders. Yeah. That's really what it boils down to. And coaching is so underrated, right? And so the people that are in my teams, I said, man, I will always want to carve time that I can lean into them and go, you're killing it at this. Here's who I see you are. And if you ever need me, here's what I think. And what has happened, leaders that have moved on naturally, they're leading other organizations, still call me. They still, hey, let's talk about this. And so for me, that culture of a team is I lead through encouragement um, and create, uh, the other thing I would say is I open doors. Yeah. Let's create opportunities right. for people to win because that keeps my ego in check. I, you know, let's just, just be honest. I want you to see and look at me and go, man, he was a good decision. But if I take all the wins from everybody else, right. then it's just about me. So then if I'm looking at you going, hey, Kent, watch this guy or watch this lady. She's leading so tough right now. Look at what she's doing. We've moved now from me needing approval, no, to we raise leaders. Right. And yeah. so that's, that to me is, a, is, is what I'd fight for in a culture. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, respect. Uh, fair treatment. I yeah. mean, when I look at what I, I fight for, that that's, has to be a significant part. You know, acceptance, appreciation uh, for uniqueness, diversity, enthusiasm, um, you know, equal opportunity, honest communication. These are the non-negotiables that I, I think every organization has to fight for yeah. and has to believe in to, to make an empowering culture. As we uh, kind of bring this to a close today and, and move into kind of that fire round, uh, let's address two real situations that uh, you can face as a leader navigating the waters of culture. And so, Chris, what do you do if there is a toxic individual threatening the culture of the entire organization? How do you know when to really do everything you can to work with them and empower them? Or 
how do you know when that moment comes that maybe it's time to move that individual on? Yeah. So I, I call it the art of the bounce, right? It's both personal and with a toxic person. When do they need to go? Do they need to go? So first thing that, that, uh, that we do is we assess, we assess the situation firsthand. Right. So depending on where this person is in the organization, if they're if they're uh, three or four levels away from me, then I'm going to have interaction with their up leader uh, talking through our common language and go, okay, how have you assessed their behavior? Is this your personal opinion or is this quantifiable? What's their 360? I mean, we use those here at the university. We use all sorts of assessments that help us determine is this person toxic? So once we do, we assess the situation, then we afford respect, as you say, and, and we get in a room with people and go, hey, here is the process. Here's what we think. And so if a person uh, says, I really don't care, this is what I believe, I'm going to act the way I want. When they choose self over community, they've self-ejected. Yeah. Uh, they, they've made that decision for us. Uh, and so then you just look and go, hey, we appreciate it. I mean, one of our earlier playbooks, it was in writing, uh, brilliant jerks won't be tolerated. Right. right? We don't care how smart right. you are, how great you are. <laughs> if you mistreat people, you're not going to last long on our campus. And so, you know, everything's context. So depending on how that comes out is how quickly we deal with it. We like to coach people. I mean, you, you have shown me uh, uh, great patience, what that looks like with raising up leaders. So we're not quick to go up. Oh, you don't fit. You're out. Right. Hey, let's work through this. Let's put together a growth plan. Can you get there? But the big thing we're learning now at this size, every time we see a toxic uh, individual or, or a moment like that, we're, we go back and reflect on the system. Right. Do we have adequate onboarding processes that ensures we're hiring the right people with shared values? And that's probably at 10 years into this, I'm realizing finding people, I can find people who share my values and have the skill set. So I would just say to other leaders, don't be afraid to confront, give people the benefit of the doubt, and don't be afraid to let someone go. Right. They will hurt your organization far more than it'll hurt you for that short season. Yeah. And I think a, a, a significant key to recognizing that is spiritual discernment. Yeah. You can have all the knowledge in the world. You can have, you know, a full understanding of the context. Um, and you may think you know exactly what needs to. But then there is that element of spiritual discernment. And discernment is a gift. God can give you, and you need to seek that, that you can, in that moment, hear what the, the Holy Spirit is saying yeah. so that you will navigate what God's will will be for the, the, the organization, but also what will be God's will for that individual yeah. that, um, that you may have to make a tough decision in. But... But yeah, spiritual discernment is is a, is a key factor for me as well in that in that process. Yeah. Well, Chris, I want to I want to thank you for joining me today on Framework Leadership Podcast. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for your gifts, your abilities, your talents, the way you bring the the cultural life um, to a significant uh, relevance in, in uh, here at SCU. Uh, for all of our listeners, I hope that you leave this conversation uh, today with the ability to you know, better understand your context, your culture, your environment. And if you think you may have a poisonous culture, it's never too late to right the ship and begin that process to bring it to a, a healthy culture. Well, we'll see all of you next time on Framework Leadership.